All right, so we are making our way through Unit 6 of Jews, Israel, and Jesus. And Unit 6 is called Covenant. God is a covenant-keeping God. God has entered into various covenants with His people, and it's important for us to understand these covenants and how they work and what the terms and requirements of them are. Well, we have made our way to point D, which is the Sinai Covenant. This would also be called the Law of Moses. Well. God knows the end from the beginning. God knew, and he said, in advance, he knew that the people of Israel were going to fail to fulfill their side of the covenant. So he knew that these blessings were going to come upon them, but he also knew that the curses were going to come upon them. But even in that already right there in Leviticus 26 and also in the book of Deuteronomy, God knows and speaks the end from the beginning. He has made a way for his rebellious people to be restored to him. He knows it all. He still loves them and he will not forsake or abandon them because he has chosen them and he has made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be God to their descendants. So let's look at this. This is Leviticus 26, starting with verse 40. So after all of these curses have come upon the people, now God is picking up at the end of all the list of the curses. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them, and they shall make amends for their iniquity, because they spurned my rules and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them." Neither will I abhor them so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them. So you see, God, what did we say in the first class about covenant? Even if the other party is not faithful to the covenant, a faithful and honorable person will not break covenant, even if the other one does. So God, he is faithful and honorable above all all else. He will not break covenant with his people, and he will not break covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God will not abhor or destroy the people of Israel. He will not break his covenant with them. He says, for I am the Lord, their God, but I will for their sake remember the covenant with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of all the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So remember, God made a name for himself when he brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. And the whole world knows that the people of Israel are the people of the Most High God. So God is going to continue to claim them as his own for the sake of his name. But again, you see here, if they, I will. If they confess, if they repent, I will, I will, I will. And this is, he will not spurn them or destroy them. He will not break covenant with them. He will still be their God. And don't miss it, he says, and I will remember the land. We're going to talk about the land in a later unit. Well, the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord also foresaw that the people of Israel were going to forsake him and not keep the terms of the covenant. So let's read these passages so you know that God is not confused or surprised or powerless when his people go into rebellion and disobedience. So this is Deuteronomy 31. We're going to start with verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. That means, Moses, you're about to die. 
Then this people will rise and whore after foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. You know, I just love God is a straight talker. He spoke to Moses plainly, face to face, like a man speaks to his friend. This is not a mystery or a riddle or some dream or vision that needs to be interpreted. God says they're going to forsake me. They're going to break covenant with me. That's it. This is what's going to happen. They're going to whore after foreign gods. This is what they're going to do. We're up to verse 17. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? So instead of understanding that these evils coming upon them are the curses of the law, the people are going to say, well, God must not be with us anymore. I don't know what happened because they're not going to perceive correctly why things are happening. We're at verse 18. And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done because they have turned to other gods. Now, therefore, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten, and they are full, and have grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and despise me and break my covenant. See, there it is. They're going to break the covenant. We're at verse 21. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do even today before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. So God says plainly, they're going to break the covenant, and therefore I have to inflict the consequences and the curses of the covenant upon them. But Moses goes on to sing this song and write this song, and we're not going to go through all of Deuteronomy 32, but it's another chapter that I encourage you to read for yourself. God knows the end from the beginning, and he rules so sovereign and supreme over all creation. Nothing that has happened to the Jewish people is a shocker to him. He has called it all from the beginning. But we are going to read through a few passages from Deuteronomy 32. This is from the Song of Moses, but please do take the time and read the whole thing for yourself. We're going to pick up at verse 19. Now, this is after the description of how God chose the people of Israel. He blessed the people of Israel, and then as he said in what we just read, they grow fat. And once they grow fat, they start to rebel against God and be superior in their own minds and start worshiping other gods rather than staying obedient to the Lord. So starting Deuteronomy 32, verse 19, the Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous for those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol, that's the place of the dead, that's the fires of hell, devours the earth earth and its increase, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. And I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. Remember the covenant with Noah? God hung up his bow. No more bow and arrows. Well, God is going to spend his arrows on his people once they spurn him and reject him to go and worship other gods. We're at verse 24. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors the sword shall bereave, and indoors terror for young man and woman alike, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. That's the young and the old. We're up to verse 26. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces. I will wipe them from human memory. Had I not feared the provocation of the enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand 
understand, lest they should say, Our hand has triumphed. It was not the Lord who did all this. So yet again, God is not going to completely destroy his people, not because of their obedience or faithfulness. No, God is not going to completely destroy his people for the sake of his own name in the sight of the nations, but also in the sight of the enemy, that ancient serpent, lest that ancient serpent think that he has succeeded against the Most High God in destroying the people of God, the seed of God that was called to bring forth the one who would crush the head of the serpent. God is not going to allow the enemy or adversaries of his own people to think that they have the ultimate victory. It is God who sovereignly allows enemy nations to oppress his people for their own disobedience. But that does not mean that God is weak. God will ultimately vindicate his people. So we're going to jump down to verse 36. Verse 36 says exactly that, for the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. So when his people are fatigued and exhausted and the remnant is so small, they are crying out to God. They are confessing their sins. They are turning to the Lord. When God sees that it looks absolutely hopeless from the world's perspective, God will step in and do what only God can do, and he will vindicate his people. It goes on. Then he will say, where are their gods, the rock in which they took refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. So God is exalting his sovereignty over all things. He is the one with the power of life and death. He is the one with power over all nations. He goes on, for I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment. I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long haired heads of the enemy. So God is saying, I will have total vengeance and vindication for my people and anyone who sets themselves up as an enemy of me. He says, I am the Lord and I will be vindicated in the sight of all nations, and my people will be vindicated for all the evils that have come upon him. God will, in the end days, show his power, not only as the sovereign ruler and God over all the earth, but God of his covenant people. So we're at verse 43. Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. Adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. So it is not a good idea to be an enemy of Israel. The day is coming, even if it looks like the nations of this world or the enemies gather together against Israel, God Almighty is the one in the end who will take vengeance upon all adversaries of himself and of his people. This is a father looking out for the blood of his children, and he will surely avenge in that day. See, God knew the end from the beginning. He knew that his people would experience the blessing. He knew that his people would experience the curse, and he's already prepared for all of it, and he's already prepared to swoop in as an act of love and vengeance on behalf of his covenant people.
All right, so the things we just talked about will happen at the end of the age. And at the end of the age, this covenant, the Sinai covenant, will depart. It will reach its term limit and it will be over. So I want to show you just a few scriptures that say that. So you know that this covenant is fading away. It is still in effect while this world and this earth and these heavens are still here. This covenant is still in effect. The people of Israel are still the covenant people of God. So let's look. Jeremiah 30. 31, starting with verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. So this is the God who created all things and set the schedule for the sun and the moon and the stars and all the things in all creation. We're at verse 36. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. So if then, if the sun, the moon, and the stars cease to function the way that I designed them at the original creation, then Israel will cease being a nation from before me. So what that means is, as long as the sun keeps coming up every day, as long as the moon keeps coming up every night, as long as the stars are in the sky, then Israel are still a nation before the sight of God. That's it. That's what God is saying clearly. Jeremiah 33, he says it again. This is starting with verse 20. 25. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes and have mercy on them. So again, God is saying, if I'm not the God of all creation, if I'm not the one who set up the sun, the moon, the stars, the day, the night, the fixed order of heaven and earth, well, then I'll reject Israel. Then I'll reject David. Then I won't be the God of the people and the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But, you know, because God is, then he is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants who are the people and the nation of Israel. And God says, I will restore their fortunes and have mercy on them. Mercy is not because they deserve it. Mercy is they're not going to get what they deserve. Grace and blessing is is they're going to be restored and blessed, even though they do not deserve it. God will have mercy on them. Now, at the end of the age, let's look at what's going to happen at the end of the age. There's a new heavens and a new earth that is coming, and we will dwell with God forever for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, but that will come at the end of the age. So let's just quickly look at some scriptures that say that. Isaiah 51, verse 6. Six, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Okay, so what that's saying is that the heavens are going to vanish, and the earth is going to wear out. So this heavens and this earth, there is an end. And God just said, well, if those ever end, then my covenant with the people of Israel will also end. So there is an end at the end of the age. The Sinai covenant expires. Let's look at another scripture. Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. So again, this heaven, this earth will perish. They will wear out, and God will change them the way that a man changes his robe. They will pass away. So the Sinai covenant will expire when this heaven and this earth and the fixed order of things in this creation passes away. Why? Because, last verse, Isaiah 65, 17, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. So God is doing a new 
thing. Jeremiah also promises a new covenant. We're going to talk about that in a couple of classes. But God is doing a new thing. The law of Moses, the Sinai covenant, the if you, then I, two-sided covenant, it has a term limit and it runs out at the end of this age. Thank you.